Italian opera in the footsteps of Verdi and Puccini. My name is Victoria Hansen and I'm the programme manager here at the New York Times Four Times Journeys and it's my pleasure to welcome you today and to also introduce to you later on our specialist subject matter expert who's joining our Times Journeys departure, Fred Plotkin, one of America's leading opera experts. But why travel with the New York Times? Well, first and foremost, each of our 70 plus departures is accompanied by one of our New York Times journalists or Times selected experts. So you could be touring around Russia with a Pulitzer Prize winner or sampling the food and wine of Provence with a well-renowned sommelier. We offer more than 25 different programmes and for each of these we offer either land-based tours or cruises. The land-based tours are limited in size to no more than 25 people and the cruises we hold on world-renowned cruise lines. We only visit destinations that tell a story, so it could be discovering the paths of Cuba or Myanmar, the food and wine of Provence, or in today's example, the uh, arts and culture of Italy. For alongside each of our trips, we offer exclusive access or hard-to-reach hard tickets. This could be uh, museums that open especially for our group, either before, uh, before the crowds arrive or at the end of the day, or else opening night tickets for performances. So a few of the trip highlights for today's tour. Obviously Fred Plotkin himself is one of the major draws. He'll be accompanying our group throughout, offering pre-performance discussions and formal lectures on both opera and culinary delights. As I mentioned before, we've obtained opening night tickets for a new production of Puccini's fantastic opera Turner Dot at La Scala. You'll also be able to enjoy a magnificent contemporary performance of La Traviata at renowned opera house La Fenice in Venice. You will attend a concert at La Scala with the Berlin Philharmonic, conducted by Sir Simon Rattle, and you'll also have tickets to Beethoven's Fidelio, conducted by Zuba Mehta during Florence's Maggio Musicale, one of the most prestigious opera festivals in the world. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce you to Fred Plotkin, who's one of the world's leading opera experts. He's got more than 40 years experience in the opera industry, and he's worked in some of the world's greatest opera companies and theatres, including spending five years at the Metropolitan Opera and directing at La Scala. He's an author of numerous books and articles on opera and classical music, and he's also a food expert who's written six books on Italian cuisine. He has been profiled and interviewed on numerous occasions for the New York Times, and we've actually called him a New Yorker with the soul of an Italian. I'm delighted to introduce Fred, not only as the presenter of today's webinar, but also as the time selected specialist who accompanies our tour. Welcome, Fred. Well, thank you, Victoria, and buongiorno to all of you. I do love this new media in which I can be with you from here in New York, and you could be listening and dreaming of Italy wherever you want to be. So the tour that I've been fortunate to plan with Times Journeys for the New York Times is very carefully planned. I, I think that it's important to understand that this is not tourism. This is a lifetime experience, once in a lifetime experience, even if you've been to Italy many times. So for example, we land in Venice on April 25th. This is not by accident. April 25th is the feast day of St. Mark, the patron saint of Venice. So when we land in Venice, the entire city will be in celebration, not just for St. Mark, but for our arrival, of course. And we'll check into a hotel, we'll get our first sensations of Venice, we will be near the Grand Canal. Gondolas, a procession for St. Mark will take place on the Grand Canal. And our welcoming dinner will be a dinner in which we will celebrate Venice, its food specialties, and the week that will come. You should know that opera, of course, was born in Italy in 1597. It was born in Florence, but it really took hold in Venice, which was the first opera capital. Opera in Venice was at its peak in the 17th century when the city had 17 different opera houses and 388 world premieres were presented in the city of Venice. No city in the world 
rival set, not Vienna, not Milan, not New York, not London, not even Paris, which was the world capital of opera in the 19th century. So when we land in Venice, we will go to our hotel. We will have a nice restful evening. We'll have a good meal. And then the next day, we will go to Teatro La Fenice. How many of you have been to Teatro La Fenice, which for many people is the most beautiful, perfect little opera house in the world? There are 700 seats. The name means the Phoenix. Why is it called the Phoenix? Because it's an opera house that was built on the ashes of a previous opera house that stood on that site. If you know Venice, or even if you've read about Venice, you know that the city is built on water, on canals, and access to buildings is not easy. Obviously, in modern times, they've improved fire safety considerably and not to worry. But in the past, buildings burned down all the time in Venice. Despite all the water you, is there that you'd think could put out the fires, they couldn't do it. So this theater rose from the ashes of a previous theater in 1792. It, too, has had a couple of fires in its history, one of them not too long ago. And when they rebuilt it, there was the choice, do we build a modern opera house or do we build an opera house that is identical to the one that was there? This being Italy, being Venice, where everyone has an archive, they had the original fabric samples, the original paint chips, and were able to redo the theater as it was with two very important differences. The differences were that it has much better fire safety, thank goodness, but it also has, for the first time, a modern opera stage, a stage where you can produce some of the greatest opera productions in the world. And Teatro La Fenice, an opera in Venice, has had an incredible revival since the theater reopened. Now, the opera that we're going to see is by Giuseppe Verdi, my patron saint, other people like St. Mark, I like St. Giuseppe of Verdi, and it's called La Traviata. And I know that you have all seen La Traviata in one form or another, but have you seen it in the theater where it was premiered on March 6th, 1853? This was famously one of the biggest fiascos in opera history. Believe it or not, they didn't like La Traviata in part because the woman who sang it was not plausible as someone on the brink of death. She obviously enjoyed her Italian food too much, and therefore uh, the audience didn't like it. They recast with a different soprano, and all of a sudden La Traviata became one of the most beloved of all operas, and it premiered in Venice. We will see it in a modern production by Robert Carson. When the Teatro La Fenice opened, Again, after having been rebuilt, this was the production they opened with. And it's a very famous production. Carson is from Toronto, and he's one of the top opera directors in the world. And I'm very happy that we will be able to see his production for our first opera in Venice. Now, Verdi spent a lot of time in Venice, and he composed five operas for Teatro La Fenice. Another was Simone Bocanegra. Attila was another one and therefore he knew the city very well. He knew because he was from the part of Italy that has the best food, Emilia Romagna, where to find good food in Venice. Now, I, I think you know about me, that apart from my working in opera, I have a great passion for real Italian food. And what is real Italian food? Italian food is regional, it's local, it's seasonal. Now, we all use those terms now, but at the time, these were strictly Italian. Verdi was a farmer. He grew his own food. He would bring food with him when he traveled because he was that discerning about food. So I want you to understand that while many trips you could travel on may offer food, generic food, touristy kind of food, every single bite and every sip that you will have is something that I researched and planned so that you really get a sense of local. After our stay in Venice, we're gonna to go to the province of Modena. And I took this photograph and I salivate just to look at it because Modena, which is where Luciano Pavarotti was from and Mirella Freni, 
is one of the great citadels of Italian food and therefore world food culture. It is where Parmigiano Reggiano is produced along with Parma, Bologna, Mantova, and Reggio Emilia. It is the home of the real Aceto Balsamico Tradizionale, what you might call balsamic vinegar. But when you taste it in Modena, you will understand that it's a whole other thing. And we will explore the culture of Aceto Balsamico Tradizionale in Modena. So I must move to another slide because my mouth is salivating too much to stay here. After our lunch in or near Modena, we're going to Florence. Now, I said to you that Florence is the place where opera was born. It was born, we know exactly when, in 1597. And we know exactly where, a place called the Camerata Fiorentina, not far from the Duomo, the dome that you're looking at. It's Brunelleschi's dome on the right side of your screen. And it was a group of scholars. One of them was the father of Galileo. Another was a friend of Michelangelo, Tommaso de Cavalieri. This group got together and said, let's create a new art form, opera lirica, a lyric work. We now call it opera, but in Italy it's called opera lirica. And the opera lirica was a combination of poetry, dance, visual arts, orchestral music, vocal music, and so on. The problem was it was very academic because all of these elements stood side by side with one another. And it took a genius, Claudio Monteverdi, to understand that the only way for this lyric work to really function and be something great was to combine the elements and not have them side by side. The Florentines didn't like that. So that's when Monteverdi went off to Venice and that's how Venice became the first capital of opera. But it's very important to understand that this city, Florence, cradle of the Renaissance, was the birthplace of opera. We're going to explore those roots considerably while we're there. Now, Florence, being the birthplace of opera, is also the home of the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino, the Florentine musical May. Never mind that it always starts in April. And we will be going to a performance of Beethoven's Fidelio. But before that, we're going to talk a bit about Florence itself. The David, of course, was created in Florence in 1503 by Michelangelo Bonarotti. I study Michelangelo. He's another hero of mine. And we will discuss him in great detail while we're in Florence, along with the, all the other Florentine artists. But what you need to understand about Michelangelo was, even though he spent more of his time in Rome, when he signed his correspondence, it was always Michelangelo Bonarotti Fiorentino, Florentine. And the David, I'll give you a sneak preview now, is a symbol of Florentine freedom and its defense against outside attacks. And, and the famous nude sculpture is about its perceived vulnerability and courage. Now, the David that you see in the Piazza della Signoria, this photo here, is a copy. The original real sculpture stood there until the 1870s when the Florentines built the Academia, where the David is now housed. Now, what you need to know is that many of the great Florentine works of art, because they are so sought after, have limited amounts of space for people to go see it. So when you sign up for this trip, you also want to say that on our free day in Florence, which we will have, you want to book to see the David, you want to book to see the Uffizi, and we can arrange this for you. This way you will not miss out. And even if you've seen the David and the Uffizi and many Florentine art treasures, it never hurts to go again. So we purposely planned this trip for you to have a full day in Florence because it is, after all, one of the most remarkable cities in Italy. And then we will go see Beethoven's Fidelio. Fidelio is his only opera, it premiered in 1805, Zubin Mehta will conduct. Zubin Mehta is the head of the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino, and it is one of the greatest works ever written. Everyone says it's the greatest first opera ever written, but that's only because Beethoven never composed a second one. But Fidelio is about freedom. It's about human rights. La Scala, in fact, just had its opening night of the season, and they presented Fidelio. So you might say, why am I going to Italy to hear a German opera? 
it's because this is one of the um, everyone's shortlist of one of the greatest operas ever composed. And that's why we'll hear it, and that's why the Macho Musicale will present it. Now, when I've led trips such as this one with other organizations, that we have never gone in the footsteps of Giacomo Puccini. If you're an American, chances are your favorite Italian opera composer is Puccini. If you're an Italian, your favorite opera composer is Verdi. And we'll explore why that is when we're there. But very few people actually get to go see where Puccini lived and worked. And there's a reason for that. His villa is seldom open to the public. So what we've arranged is a private visit to the home of Giacomo Puccini in a place called Torre del Lago, which is tower by the lake is what it means. And he lived on a lake that has the hardest name to pronounce, but I will try to do it. Lago di Massachuculi, Massachuculi. And he lived on this lake. He had a little villa. He was a hunter. He would go out every day and he would capture his food or he'd fish in the lake. <coughs> Sorry, he'd bring back his food. He'd hand it to the cook to cook. And then he would sit down and compose. And after his meal, he would compose all through the night. And he was, he was a night owl. You can see by the rings under his eyes. And he smoked, unfortunately, up to 90 cigarettes a day. And interestingly, in his villa, they kept things as they were, not with the cigarette butts, thankfully, but all the ashtrays throughout the house. So when we walk through his villa, you will come to understand the man, and I will help you do that, by looking at all the artifacts. Puccini who was born in 1858 and died in 1924, was fascinating because he was a modernist. He was the first person to embrace technology among all the composers. He loved radio. He understood recordings. He had his voice recorded in New York when he visited New York in 1910 so that he would be documented for the future. We can hear his recorded voice from 1910. He had one of the first telephones in Italy, which is great, but the problem was he had no one to call because no one else had a telephone. He owned 15 cars. He was into motors. He was fascinated by technology and was one of the innovators of technology in opera theaters, and this is something we will discuss. So it's not just the romantic Puccini of Bohème, of uh, Tosca, of Madame Butterfly, that we know and love. But I want you to discover the man and the innovations he made and, be, and why he became the most important and popular opera composer of the 20th century. And we have to eat. And Tuscan bread is very famous. I'll every day be teaching you about the food culture, about why, for example, Tuscan bread has no salt in it and how it's intended to go with other things. But that's just a passing remark. Um, we will be there when all the fresh fruit and vegetables and products are coming in. And again, our daily discovery will be the so-called cucina povera, the poor cuisine of Tuscany. Poor is no reflection on quality. It's a reflection on the fact that they use superb primary materials. We'll go to markets. I'll be glad to discuss any Italian food product you want. And this will be a big part of understanding that this food fed Italian genius, whether it was Michelangelo, whether it was Verdi, or any of the other people that we will be discovering. Food played an important part because if your stomach is happy, your mind can work better. Chianti, wine. Tuscany produces some of the greatest wines in the world. And we will be drinking marvelous wines there. Chianti to you may sound like just sort of a basic table wine. It can be that. But this is the region that's produced Brunello di Montalcino, Moralino di Scanzano, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, all of these wines, Vernaccia di San Gimignano. And we will taste it. And I'll be glad to discuss any wine questions you have with you. You have it all. And then... Ultimately, we leave Tuscany and we get back on the road and we go back to Emilia Romagna, Italy's gastronomic heartland, but also the place that gave us Verdi, Toscanini, Renata Tibaldi. Many of the great figures in Italian opera history came from Emilia Romagna. 
and we will be going to the town of Busseto. Verdi was born near Busseto in 1813. We will go to his birthplace, and we will go to, and that's his birthplace. I took this photograph on a rare occasion when there were no tourists there. Uh, we will discover his humble origins, and I'll be glad to tell you about how Verdi developed his knowledge of food, of wine, of opera, being all the way out in the country. It's a rather remarkable story. Uh, he was a genius, but he had no education. He learned everything because it was put in front of him. And we will visit his villa where he lived. He had a farm. He raised pigs. He raised cattle for cheese. He was the first grower of persimmons in Italy. And when he signed his letters, he signed it Giuseppe Verdi Agricoltore, or farmer. He was a fascinating figure. This is the region of Parmigiano Reggiano, the king of cheeses. While we're there, we're going to stop for a meal in a little town, basically two streets. The town is called Zibello. And Zibello produces most of the best food specialties that Emilia Romagna can serve. People don't know to go there, but it's a restaurant that would have pleased Giuseppe Verdi, and I know it will please you. And Emilia Romagna is the region of prosciutto, of insaccati, which is a term that we use to describe all cured meats. And I'll explain to you in detail, but long story short, the salt that is used to make these specialties comes from the Italian Riviera, from La Spezia, and historically was brought two hours inland because they knew that this salt, which goes in a little bit of the salami, salame from salt, in the prosciutto, in the cheeses, was better than any other salt they could have chosen. You will be amazed at the sophistication of the Italian palate. Even if you think you know it, I promise you, you're going to discover things you never thought about. These are cooked tortelli, which are from Parma. I took that picture, and again, I'm going to salivate if we leave it on the screen, so just remember that image, and we're going to go on. We're going to go to Milan. Milan is the financial capital of Italy. It's Italy's world city. It is the home of Teatro La Scala, which if for no other reason, every opera lover who goes to the opera in his or her life wants to go to La Scala. It is what the Vatican is to the Catholic Church, what Mecca is to Muslims. La Scala is to opera lovers. What you're looking at is the Duomo. And the center of Milan has the largest Gothic cathedral in the world, the Duomo, the Piazza del Duomo. And from there, radiating in all directions are palaces, museums. Not far from there is Da Vinci's Last Supper. Da Vinci lived in Milan for 25 years. He revolutionized the city because he understood technology. He built canals. He did all of his scientific research there. And by advanced arrangement, and this is why I want you to remember to do that, you can see Da Vinci's Last Supper, which everybody wants to see. And I will explain to you the history of the Last Supper while we're there. There is also in Milan something called the Biblioteca Ambrosiana, the Ambrosian Library. And it has wonderful works by Raphael, by Michelangelo, by Leonardo. It's one of the great undiscovered museums of the world, and it's only about two blocks from the Milan Cathedral. Milan in the 19th century is where Verdi lived, and he composed seven operas for La Scala, and it was from Milan that the revolution for Italian national unity was launched. It was launched by Verdi on the stage of La Scala in 1842. There were riots, there were demonstrations, it's amazing how political opera is and can be. And opera in Milan is equated with national identity. Every December 7th, the entire city shuts down for the opening of La Scala. And that recently happened. They happened to do Beethoven's Fidelio. And all of the city turns out. They eat a special cake called Panettone on that day. They drink sparkling wine, and the entire city celebrates Sant'Ambrogio, the patron saint. Now, connecting the Piazza del Duomo 
and La Scala is the Milan Galleria. And long before anyone built shopping malls anywhere in the world, there was this incredibly elegant gallery, this passageway in which there are cafes, there are restaurants, there are coffee bars, there are wine bars. And it's a remarkable place that everyone in Milan sooner or later passes through. You will too, as you go en route to La Scala. There it is. Now, a lot of people say to me, it does look like the fanciest opera house in the world. It's not the most ostentatious. And that's true, because when you're one of the very best, you don't have to show it off. So it's a rather simple entrance. It's the entrance that Verdi knew. You see the carriageway that he would enter. And inside that theater is all the history of Italian opera. There's a wonderful museum that you can go to. We can arrange that. And you will see how Italian opera evolved and how Italian theater evolved. But there's something I'd like to mention to you before we go to a performance of Puccini's tour and daughter La Scala that I'll tell you about in a moment. We're going to have a very special, really wonderful private visit. Verdi understood that because of musicians who were not famous, members of choruses, orchestras, singers who sang small roles, because of them, his operas were the successes that they became. And he built a building called the Casa di Riposo per Musicisti, which translates as the rest home for musicians. Now, they're not really resting there. We're going to have a private visit and meet many of these great older artists who have performed and can recount the history of Italian opera in the 20th century. What they have there is young musicians come to live with, keep company with, learn from these senior artists. And we will have a meal either there or nearby that's still being determined in which we will explore the development of Italian opera, where it went in the 20th century and where it stands now in the 21st. And then that evening, May 1st, which is an important day in Italy, it's another holiday, we will go to the opening night of a new production of Puccini's most magnificent, extravagant opera, Turandot, and it stars Nina Stemma, the Swedish soprano. Now, you, you may know the name. When the International Opera Awards were created in 2013, Nina Stemma was named the best singer in the world, so she's very much in demand. Ricardo Chailly will conduct. Alexander Zantonenko, a wonderful Latvian tenor, will also perform. And the production of Turandot should be something remarkable. Why is it taking place on May 1st? The reason is, is that Milan has planned an expo. It's been working on it for many years about feeding the world, feeding the planet, about living well, but sustainably. The Milan Expo opens on May 1st in the evening, but to the public on May 2nd. And this very extraordinary concert performance that we're going to of Turandot will be for the opening of the Milan Expo. So it's one of the splashiest events in the year. It will be covered everywhere in the world, and you will be inside La Scala for that event. The next day, if you wish, this will be optional, you can visit the Milan Expo, or you might prefer to see things in Milan, such as the Last Supper, do shopping on Via Monte Napoleone, which is one of the most famous shopping arcades in the world. You know that Milan is the center of Italian fashion, remarkably stylish, and if you prefer to do that, that would be fine. That evening, we go back to La Scala. This is our farewell evening together. We will have a wonderful Milanese meal before, I promise. And then at nine o'clock, as part of the celebrations for the opening of the expo, the Berlin Philharmonic, considered by many the world's greatest orchestra, will come with their music director to La Scala, and we will hear a concert of Bruckner's Seventh Symphony conducted by Sir Simon Rattle. After that, We'll have to say arrivederci. It will be a pleasure. We will have memories to discuss. We will have ideas to share. And I know that this kind of trip that we're going to do, it's really an adventure. It's not tourism. 
It's pleasurable education. You'll come away having made friends. You'll come away having seen things that anyone who visits Italy never gets to see. And you'll want to do it again, and I'll be there to do it with you. I'm ready for questions, and I thank you all very much. So thank you very much, Fred. My mouth's watering, and wow, there are so many exciting um, events taking place during this tour. It's going to be an amazing opportunity for everybody. Um, as Fred said, we're now opening up for questions. If anybody does have anything um, that they'd like to share with us, then there's a, a question tab in the right-hand side of the panel. Please feel free to, to type anything in there. Um, I know that we've um, been, been sent a few in already, um, specifically around um, the seats themselves at the performances, which obviously is really important. Um, we always provide the best category tickets, the orchestra tickets, for any of these performances. Um, so for all of the, of the events that we'll be going to, you'll have the best category tickets there. Um, in terms of activity levels, um, we want to make sure that you have as much energy as possible to, to enjoy the operatic performances themselves. So we don't do a huge amount of walking on these tours. The main focus is on, on the operatic performances themselves um, and enjoying Fred's commentary um, both throughout the trip and as a, a pre-performance too. To which I would add, however, that free time has been allocated in every city because we know that you do want to get out and explore, shop, whatever, see a museum. And therefore, in each of these cities, you will have time if you wish. Many people prefer just to nap and rest to be fully prepared for the musical performances. But if you'd like to go out, you do have that option. In terms of single travelers, um, we get an awful lot of single travelers on Time's Journeys, and I wouldn't want anybody to feel uh, discouraged about being on their own and um, quite often people meet friends we know on past trips uh, for times journeys that people are now still in touch with with the people that they met previously so it's a great opportunity to to meet new friends um, and to experience the city um, with a lot of like-minded individuals as well um, one question's just come up here um, do performances have english subtitles so I think it says third titles. The answer is, in some cases, yes. Uh, if you know the Metropolitan Opera, you know that the Met has titles on the backs of seats. Most theaters do not have that. La Scala, however, does have that in Italian and in English, so you'll be able to follow that. La Fenice does projected titles, but I'm not certain if they do them just in Italian or if they do them in Italian and English, and similar with Florence, but absolutely La Scala, you'll be able to follow. And I will tell you every detail of the story. And another question just coming, can we tour backstage um, and see any of the costume shop sets, et cetera? That is based on availability. I would probably say to you that it's unlikely at La Scala because whenever a theater does a new production, on the day of the new production, they tend to close off the theater entirely. We can look into whether we will have that on the Saturday, which is when the Berlin Philharmonic is there that evening. As to the one in Florence, they've just built a new theater and they don't yet do backstage tours. And as to the one in La Fenice, I will give you a tour of all the public areas. The backstage at La Fenice is rather small even now because it's built on a very small footprint. But um, we can find out about La Scala for May 2nd. Um, one question that we quite often get asked is, is international airfare included? Now, we found that a lot of our guests like to use air miles to book their flights, so that's not something that's included in the price. Um, this will give you the flexibility to book um, however you would prefer. One final question. How many days is the trip and what is the cost? Well, thank you very much for asking that question because seamlessly now we can move to the final slide. Um, our tour departs on April the 25th. It runs to May the 3rd. It's $9,550. Um, there's a single supplement charge of, of $1,850. Um, and of course, if you have any other questions afterwards, feel free to, to contact our reservation center on 855-698-7979.
I think we can just squeeze one final question in there. Um, so that's in lieu of uh, subtitles or subtitles, how about Liberetti? That can certainly be arranged if you wish. Um, my approach when I teach opera, and I am America's opera teacher, is to discuss the operas at length before because the main message in opera comes in the music and in the staging. The words were always the launching pad for that, but certainly if we want to arrange libretti ahead of time, I think we can do that. Fantastic. Okay, well, unless there are any other questions, I'm going to close it there. I'd like to thank you, Fred, for, for attending today. We really appreciate it. And of course, for joining us on what will be this very, very special trip. It's our only departure to Italy that focuses on opera in 2015. So it's it's now or never, and with only 25 spaces available, I really would encourage you to book um, sooner rather than later. As I mentioned earlier, our reservation specialists can be reached on 855-698-7979. Please don't hesitate to contact them with any questions or to book. And alternatively, you can visit our website, which is mytimes.com forward slash times journey. Thank you very much for attending, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you in April.